Hello, welcome to week 12. This week, we're gonna be focusing on something that touches everyone's lives, water. So our focus for this lecture is on streams and flooding. In the next lecture, we'll be looking at groundwater. So let's dive in. Okay, so as I mentioned, we're thinking about water stuff. And this first lecture is gonna be focused on streams and floods. So the first thing we're gonna do is just look at some stream terminology. We're gonna consider meandering streams and braided streams, and then a concept called stream flow or discharge and then look at floods and groundwater is actually shifted over to the second video. And as I've mentioned in D2L, I'm working on catching up with grading. My spring break is this week and I've decided I'm gonna start by just putting your numerical grades in so you have them. And then I'm gonna go back and add my feedback, because the feedback's really important, but I don't want that to slow me down. So let's see, I'm gonna move this silly window to down here for the moment. Um, and yes, we're looking at two streams here. The upper one is a trout stream somewhere in Minnesota. I'm not sure where. If we have any um, people who fish, you may know. And we're looking at a flooded um, roadway here in the bottom. So let's dive in. So first of all, just think, what is a stream? Well, from for earth scientists, um, we and hydrologists, we use this word stream for any flow of water that is channelized. In other words, it flows in a channel, regardless of its size. Now, there are a multitude of words that get used for streams. Um, technically, um, a stream can be tiny or it can be enormous, like, for example, the Mississippi, the Amazon, any of those really big rivers. Um, technically, they are all streams. Um, some of the other terms that get used are river, creek, run, brook, gut, wash, rivulet, gully, beck, and the list goes on and on. So the main take home message here, and you can, whoops, you can um, consider it as you look at the images on the right, is it doesn't matter how fast the water is moving, whether it's cascading over boulders or barely moving at all, or as shown here in the distance, we've got the Mississippi River flowing in, on the left-hand side, and there's some kind of um, backwater in here with a road or railway running along its side. Um, so the main story is streams channelize runoff. So runoff is the word we give to water that just moves down a hill slope. So it doesn't soak into the ground. For some reason, it is just moving over the ground surface um, until it reaches the stream. And the stream channelizes that. Now, the other thing you need to remember is, well, that water's moving down slope due to gravity. And the next thing we need to think about is how our streams organized. They're organized or they all fit within what we call drainage basins or watersheds. I'm sure you've all heard the term watershed districts. Let's now take a moment to consider drainage basins and watersheds. So I want you to start by looking at the diagram on the right here. 
It's kind of idealized, but what I want you to appreciate is that there's this kind of dashed white line running around um, an area with streams. That dashed white line marks the boundary of the drainage basin that these streams are draining. Another way to think about it is all or any water that rain that falls within that dashed line will feed this network of streams. An even um, different way to think about it is that this dashed line represents high land. Any water that falls as rain or snow for that matter on the left hand or inside that dashed line flows downslope to this drainage basin portrayed here. Water that falls on outside of this dashed line will basically be supplying water to a different drainage basin. So there's another um, set of terminology that you can see around this diagram. So they've used the term watershed as um, tying it into this dashed line that marks the boundary of the drainage basin. And the word watershed is used interchangeably with drainage basin. And one thing you might wonder is, well, but can't this watershed be divided into a multitude of smaller watersheds? Well, yes. And so the size of different drainage basins and watersheds um, depends on um, how your or the area you're interested in covering. Anyway, so um, the place where a stream starts will be its source. Often streams join together and one stream will be a tributary to another. Usually we use the word tributary for a slightly smaller stream. Um, and the comes a certain point where we have our main river channel. And then wherever it enters, either a lake or maybe the ocean, we call the stream mouth. The place where a couple of streams join together is called the confluence. So we've established um, that a drainage basin or watershed is the area supplying water to a stream. And that Area is bounded by the highest land in the area. You know, in many places, particularly in Minnesota, that might only be a foot above the stream. We don't need mountains. And another important point is all streams are part of a watershed. Now, let's take a look at this diagram now of the United States. And it identifies some of our really big watersheds or drainage basins, whoops. So here we've got the Mississippi River drainage basin shown in this area. I'm highlighting with my cursor. There is the Hudson Bay drainage basin system in blue. There is, I think this is the, oops, the Mackenzie River data um, drainage basin draining to the Arctic. And then we've got the um, Atlantic um, drainage basin that basically covers the entire Great Lakes through the St. Lawrence and then the, all the streams through the Appalachians and down into Florida that drain into the Atlantic Ocean. And then once we get across the Continental Divide, we're onto the West Coast and all the streams there um, drain towards the Pacific Ocean, except once we get into some of the Western states, there's an area that gets called the Great Basin. And there's some 
internal drainage there, water draining into that area. But what you need to notice there is that is actually a very dry or arid area. So um, much of that water um, ends up evaporating. Okay, so um, how does a geologist or a hydrologist, for that matter, look at a stream or classify streams? Well, one of the ways we do this is we consider channel patterns. So look, let's look at these two images. What I want you to notice in this aerial photo is you can see a stream. I'm highlighting it with my cursor. And that stream is just sneaking around a whole bunch of really sinuous bends. We call this a single thread stream. That means there's one main channel. And we call it a meandering stream because of this meandering or sinuous pattern. On the other hand, if you move over to the image to the right here, what I want you to appreciate is that there are multiple threads here. I'm just getting rid of that. Oh, maybe not. It won't let me. Um, so this in this image, we can see that these multiple channels separate from each other and rejoin. We call this a braided stream. So many channels and they separate and rejoin. And then in between them, there's a whole bunch of gravel and not that much in the way of vegetation. You can see some slight greenery in the area or I've got my cursor in, but really there isn't anything holding that gravel down. Now, um, let's now think about um, what the set the streams are carrying. These channel patterns, as it says here in the text, are also tied to what streams are carrying. You can think of this as being particle size, the size of the particles. Think back to when we investigated sediment and how those particles are being moved. So this is some of the work that streams do. They transport sediment. And there are actually three different ways the streams um, transport sediment, bed load, suspended load, and dissolved load. So what I want you to do now is look over towards the right-hand side of the slide. And what this is showing is stream bed here and water above it. So we're going to deal with almost the easiest one first, and that's the dissolved load. And that's something that is essentially invisible. There may be many elements that are effectively dissolved in the water. They will exist as cations of whatever elements, calcium, potassium, et cetera, et cetera, and maybe some toxins as well, um, that are in the water. But the water can look beautifully clear, just like the water in bottled water, for example, but it might still, or it will likely still be carrying some dissolved load. Then we're going to think about suspended load. So in this diagram, you can see all these funny little black arrows that are kind of wiggling all around. Um, what that's trying to capture is that there is this really fine-grained sediment that is suspended in the water as it moves. So think back to when we were considering sediments. Remember there was muds and clays? Well, they're very fine-grained material. And if the water's going fast enough, it can carry them in suspension. And if you look closely at this diagram, you can see there's all these little kind of pale brown flecks. That's trying to capture the fine-grained sediment that is suspended in the water. So we've got our suspended load, which is usually the silts and clays. Then we go to the bottom of the stream. And this is where it gets really fascinating. The water or the particles that are being transported on the floor or the bed of a stream 
are usually sand and gravel. Remember, gravel is that coarser material. And that bed load moves in a whole bunch of different ways. And that depends in part on its size and most importantly, on the velocity of the water. Sometimes um, boulders will roll along the bed of a stream. Other times they might just slide. Sometimes they end up bouncing along the floor of a stream. If you've ever been near a boulder or gravel bedded stream during um, a flood event, you can hear boulders clanking against each other. So the big message here, particularly when we're starting to think about bed load, is that the size of the particles that are being transported is a direct consequence of velocity. So before we move on with that thought, I want you to just appreciate these two images. Suspended sediment is a huge deal in Minnesota. One of the environmentally concerning issues is the total maximum daily load. There's supposed to be a limit on the amount of fine particles being carried by a stream. And this is where it gets really complicated. Why do we have some streams like um, what we see on the left on the left-hand side or here where I've got my cursor on the right-hand side. Why do some streams have a much higher sediment load? In Minnesota, it's mostly about erosion and the size of the material that's available. What we're actually looking here, looking at here, is the confluence of the St. Croix on the right and the Mississippi on the left. And look at that difference in suspended load. The Mississippi has an enormous suspended load. Part of that is a consequence of its um, the areas that it traverses in um, higher upstream, where it goes through the Minnesota River Valley and picks up a lot of fine-grained clay. Um, you can watch a video of this if you go to the link down here. So do that when you go to the slides um, in D2L. Now, getting back to stream velocity. This is particularly for people who are um, trying to integrate earth science maybe into some physics, some higher level work. I know that for some of you, this won't be appropriate, but I want you to first of all, examine this graph. Then we'll get to the text. On the x-axis, we have particle size going from finer up to coarser. On the y-axis, we have stream velocity. That's the speed of the water in centimeters per second. And what this effectively shows is the velocity that is required, first of all, to pick up or erode um, sediment. So if the sediment sitting on a stream bank or on the floor of a stream, um, how fast does the water have to be going to pick it up? And it shouldn't be any surprise that we see um, a line that um, goes up like where I my cursor is highlighting it here. Um, it picks up coarser grain material as it goes faster. There's something goofy that's happening here though. As it gets finer, it's harder to pick up the clay and silt. Well, that's because clay and silt flocculate or those fine particles often bind together. Remember clay minerals? And that makes them actually harder to erode as individual particles. What often happens is that you have to wait until the water starts to move a lot faster and then they get removed as chunks. So in this yellow area, that's velocities associated with the sediment being transported. And then 
the line that I'm highlighting now between transportation of sediment and deposition of sediment marks the boundary between when all that material is being transported, whether it's as suspended load or maybe as bed load, and when it can no longer be transported by the water. And you could start considering, well, what's the history of a particle of sand with size A? I'm going to leave you to think about that, particularly if you're teaching in uh, high school. Um, for lower grades, this is probably more than you need, even if it's fascinating. So um, the take home message here is higher velocity erodes and transports larger particles and lower velocity only erodes and deposits smaller particles. And then think about what happens as the velocity drops after a flood, for example. We see successively smaller particles being deposited. And just think about any time you've been out in an area where there's a river or stream, particularly after a flood, what do you see everywhere? You see an icky coating of mud, fine-grained particles covering everything. That's because as the velocity dropped, we see success successively smaller particles being deposited. Um, another really interesting piece here is we can go out to a stream and we can look at the size of the particles that are on the stream beaches. And we can use that to figure out how fast the water was actually moving. So this is um, a way, one of the way, ways that we learn about stream processes. All right, so just getting back to stream classification. We've already talked about channel patterns, the difference between meandering streams and braided streams. We've talked about how the sediment is moved. We talked about the grain size of the sediment. Now, just think about the presence or absence of vegetation on the banks or in the streams. So I want you to notice this meandering stream here. And it is flowing in between vegetated banks. That vegetation holds the soil or sediment down. And that means that meandering streams will slowly change their course, but they don't move their channel around anything as much as a braided stream does. So in the lower right here, we've got a braided stream. And what I want you to notice is, yes, there are multiple channels, but there is no or limited vegetation um, on those gravel or sand bars in between the channels. That means there's nothing holding that sediment down or anchoring it. So that means anytime there's a flood event, it's really easy for these, um, these multiple threads or channels to shift their location. Um, one thing I want you to just think about, what type of stream would have been most common prior to the development of plants? The answer would be braided streams because there was no vegetation holding that sediment down. Okay, so before we investigate meandering streams, a summary of braided streams. Braided streams are associated with multiple channels or often called multiple threads. Um, those channels typically relocate during flood events. There are areas of sediment called bars in between the channels. They're typically associated with coarser sediment and limited soil and vegetation. So we've got two braided stream images here. Now, let's dive into meandering streams. Meandering streams have a single channel or single 
thread. Um, they flow in their own floodplain. So here I'm highlighting with my cursor the main channel. At the moment, you can ignore all the other funky shaped little lake-like things. Oh, look at how this swings around here, where it does a really big loop and then back here and out to the right. Um, so that's our sinuous meandering pattern. I also want you to be clear that we have soils and vegetation that is stabilizing the banks. And I'm just telling you, this stream is carrying finer grained sediment. Now, the next thing we need to think about is, move this a moment, um, these meandering streams are associated with a very distinct suite of landforms. These include cut banks, point bars, meander loops, and oxbow lakes. This is what we're going to investigate right now. What I suggest you do is after going through the video, look at the slides in D2L and convince yourself of um, these features on this image. So we're going to think now about some of the work that a stream does, specifically in a meandering stream, or think about the anatomy of a stream. Um, where does it do what, or what does it do where? So we know that the stream erodes sediment, transports sediment, and deposits sediment. But we've got a couple of questions. Where does the water move fastest or slowest? How do streams change over time or along their length? And more importantly, what controls the changes in streams over time? So for this, I'm going to shift to the document camera, so bear with me for a moment. Okay, so first of all, I want you to just imagine a straight stream right here. Water, will, this is a map. We're looking down on it, bird's eye view. Water coming in at the top of the page and then flowing out at the bottom of the page. Where will the water be moving fastest? The answer is effectively in the middle of the stream. That's because in at the banks on either edge, its interaction with the bank actually slows the water down. Now, let's think now about a cross-section view of the stream. So here we are. That's a little cross-section. You can imagine, well, this is totally not to scale, but there's a little boat on the stream. Oh, we got a fish in there. Okay. So where here will the water be moving fastest? Not near the base because... That is where interaction with the bed slows the water down. Interaction with the air up at the top slows the water down. So somewhere in the center right there. There's a fancy word that is really good in Scrabble for the fastest moving water. It is called the Thalweg. Now, not many people use that word, but it's a great Scrabble word if you get those letters. I once won a game um, on Thalweg. So now I want us to think about a meandering stream. So here we have a meandering stream. We've got the water coming in near the top of the page and then going out near the bottom of the page. Um, so in a meandering stream, as a consequence of Coriolis force and a bunch of other factors, the water actually swings around. So I'm drawing the Thalweg or the fastest moving water. And you can see how it swings around. Whoops. Um, 
in the stream. So we have a complicated way for way of naming the bends in a stream. So we know which way the water's flowing. And we call the, if we imagine that our stream is overall flowing down a valley that's kind of bounded by these lines, we call this bend an outside bend. And we call this bend the inside bend. So here, this area is an inside bend. And over here is an outside bend. We come down to this loop. This area is an inside bend and an outside bend right there. So um, now let's just think about what's going to happen on the outside bend. That's where the fastest moving water is. So that means where we're going to, that will be where we have erosion. So I'm going to put a little E in a circle there. On the other hand, relatively speaking, the water will be slow on the inside bend. That's where we have deposition. We can come to this loop right here. Inside bend, that's where there will be deposition. Here we've got fast moving water up against the edge. That will be where there's erosion. Come to this bend. Inside bend, what's happening there? That will be deposition. And outside bend, that's where we have erosion. Now, we also have fancy words for the landforms that are associated with each of these um, locations. The outside bend where there's erosion is called a cut bank. The place where there's deposition is called a point bar. I'm not going to um, write these out. Here we're going to say outside bend, cut bank, inside bend, point bar. Outside bend, cut bank, inside bend, point bar. So let's now jump back and take a look at the slides. And bear with me while I make that change. So here we are. Um, so let's take a look now at our beautifully drawn stream. So once again, here we have a cut bank and they've tried to portray that. We've got the maximum velocity up against the cut bank. It's swinging around. And I'm going to move this way down here. So we've got the area with the maximum velocity. Now, what I want to do is, bear with me, we're going to just advance. Um, let's take a look at this aerial photo. What I want you to do is just pause the image and identify, um, first of all, we have the stream right here. And then we've, um, what I want you to look at is identify um, point bars and cut banks. Okay, um, so I've just picked one location. Here we've got a point bar and there is a cut bank. And I'm going to take a short break right now. We'll come back for part two of this video lecture shortly. Thank you.